My name is Sam Bauer, and this is the Basement of Ecology video. Let's come downstairs. All right. You can see this is our basement area. This is typically where you can teach one class at a time because of the acoustics of this room making all the sound really amplified. You can't really teach two classes in here at once uh, like you can possibly do upstairs. All right. So let's move over here, right near the closet. All right. This is where we store all of our materials as well as Clarence. Wow, hi Clarence. Hey. Yo, I'm here to show you this fat boy. Wonderful. The camera in here? This is our circuit panel. Yep. Yep. Make sure that they're all flipped to on completely. If you uh, have a problem with your lighting lighting and they're not it's not turning on, uh, flip everything off and then turn it back on again. That's been the solution to most of our problems. If not, contact the ranger. Because um, there's some electrical boxes outside that also need to be fixed. All right? At the beginning of the summer. This is olive oil. All right? You can use this in a variety of ways. Uh, one way is a, is a demonstration of water pollution in environmental science, or you can use it as, in weather as a way to show how like warm, dense air rises over cold, dense air. Warm, warm less dense air rises over cold, dense air, right? Because oil is less dense than water, so if you pour oil over water, you can really show the relationship between warm and cold air. These are planters. They're useless. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, yeah, this is actually useful. Sifter. Uh, you can use it to sift stuff, like dirt and stuff, or you can just use it for what I use it for, which is I put it on top of the box from the outside video, the Critter Hunt box, so that all the critters in there don't suffocate. But you know, that's on you. I also yeah, use this, uh, I also use the sifter for the uh, tanks over here. Uh, we're, 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 I might just want to spend a very brief amount of time at the tanks. All right, so you can see at the bottom, of these tanks, there's uh, a whole bunch of gravel over here at the bottom. Uh, this is gravel that we took from outside. Um, and if you just dump gravel from outside into here, there's gonna be a whole bunch of schmutz in the water. And to prevent all that schmutz from getting into the water, making the tank appear dirty, you wanna sieve all the gravel through this thing first. All right. We're gonna talk more about the tanks later, so I wanna so keep talking about this area over here. We move down, all right? So, what else do we have here? We have a uh, bird feeder, meant for hum humming for hummingbirds, never used. Um, plaster repairs bucket, still kind of wet. You can pour your plaster in here and carry it over to your uh, place of choice for nature. Um, at site, you should mix the plaster with the water in order to make sure that it has the proper consistency for pouring into your, uh, into your uh, animal print. Watering can, used for watering things. No, we don't. Um, this over here is our tray that we use for fish dissections and occasional weather demonstrations. Um, we're leaving this one here over the summer. However, you should try to make sure you get a new one at least once per year. Uh, kitchen staff should be uh, well, all right. These are buckets. Buckets are very important. Um, you should be able to lend out buckets to uh, to groups that are going fishing, so that they can actually bring you live fish. Because if not, the fish suffocate. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh buckets God. are also useful for carrying uh, dirt, gravel, and other materials to and fro, which is a large part of what your job is going to be. So make sure you always have buckets on hand. All right. Um, over here, we should have some pitchers as well as jugs. And uh, do we have the makeshift? Yeah, here's the makeshift ship, uh, jug. Over here, I have a, yes. Uh, these two are what I use when I want to uh, drain <coughs> one of these tanks efficiently. All right, <laughs> because, sorry. Uh, if you have fish, a large fish, especially uh, living in these tanks, and they're eating. Um, they're going to poop, and that poop contains ammonia. And after about a week or so, that ammonia uh, rises to levels that could potentially kill the fish living inside. All right. So every week, you should be changing. If you have fish living in these tanks, you should be changing the water within these tanks. All right. And the way you do this in a fast manner right, is you, you take um, these pitchers, you dip them in. Pull them outside, like so. 
it gets you around two-ish gallons at once, and it should take you around 10 to 20 minutes per, per tank. So you could change out all the water in the tanks in about an hour or so. All right. More stuff here. Uh, these over here are our animal posters. All right, as you can see, they're kind of rolled up right now because uh, they were kind of sticky at the beginning of the year. We didn't want to put, put them up. All right, also most of uh, the ecology staff at the time was really well versed in the animals that we uh, had here at ecology, so we did not need this uh, as a demonstration. However, uh, if you have newer staff who is not as well acquainted um, with the uh, uh, fauna living in 10 Mile River, I would highly recommend putting these posters up against this wall to serve as references for both you and the scouts. All right, uh, so, all right, over here, let's see. This is where we have bonus bones. These are bones that we don't put on display upstairs, but can still potentially be useful if something catastrophic happens to ones upstairs or, you know, another camp. Aquahunga needs our bones. That happens sometimes, we could donate it. Um, this is the closet. Just want to point this out before moving on. Um, it doesn't really close properly. The door doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So you're going to want to take a plank um, and sort of wedge it over here most of the time. The plank seems to have disappeared yeah, you're right, you're right. at the moment. Yes, uh, but normally we have a plank over here. They can kind of wedge into the door like so to prevent uh, curious scouts from wandering in here and seeing <laughs> the closet. All right. So, uh, would you, Clarence, would you like to talk about uh, this and the plastic Oh, that's gonna be easy. Uh, this is a fish bowl. Here. This one's made out of plastic. There's a glass one over there. I'd prefer using the plastic one because kids are stupid. Um, but what you do is when you're uh, doing reptile and amphibian study, uh, you take like a frog or toad, put it inside of this bin, put it on the center of the table, all the kids sitting around the table can see it, but it can't escape, and then they can work on identifying it. That's why I wouldn't suggest using the glass one, because it could totally get smacked off the table, or someone can grab it to try and see the thing better and then drop it. Um, so I never take the glass one out. Uh, I've been able to use this one all summer. Well, hopefully you'll find use for it too. Right, these are some more uh, rock samples that you can use. There's like sandstone, slate, pumice. Uh, if you want to use this for nature, you can. We didn't because we had some more interesting rock samples upstairs uh, that we used. However, these are still perfectly adequate for nature or geology if that gets brought back. Um, these glass bottles are just decoration. We found them in our woods um, over on the nature trail. Um, we are the furnaces. Um, those have been there for decades. And over there you can see one of the windows. Um, that is like the window pit where animals fall into. So occasionally, especially after a heavy rain, check that window pit. Make sure um, that there aren't any frogs, toads, or uh, salamanders hopping about in there. Because um, that would be unfortunate. All right. So over here, underneath the tanks, which are, we are going to discuss in a second, is our cabinet. And our cabinet is broken. Talk to Phil or whoever is the services director about this. All right. Anyway. It contains plaster pairs, which is stuff that you need uh, to form uh, prints for uh, nature. And it also has some linseed oil, which you can use if you want to. Um, for polishing the floor. Yeah. Uh, we also have some fertilizer and some other miscellaneous stuff in here, but for the most part, this is used to hold on to the plaster of pairs. All right. Now, uh, the tanks. Um, in the future, you're going to want to put more covers on top of each of these tanks, or maybe make your own makeshift one out of cardboard. Uh, that would be something that would be really nice in the future, because right now we're using a whole bunch of uh, fish tank lids for covers of these tanks, and they work for the most part, but there's still ways that they can improve. All right, so this is our frog tank, and um, you may notice there's a snake in there, but we'll get to that in a minute. All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, the frogs that you will most commonly encounter in this tank are for our uh, green frogs first and foremost they're like the most common type of frog found here and you can tell it's a green frog because it's that pretty they can get pretty big all right they're green and they have dark colored uh backs often with splotches on them and they can be found pretty much anywhere all of these over here are examples of green frogs now over here 
uh, this guy in the corner over here, about an inch long. That's the one that we find all over the college's back, especially near the place with the fallen over Widowmaker. So that is a leopard frog. That's pretty much about as big as they get. They don't get much bigger than that. Um, you could tell it's a leopard frog because it's got these two yellow stripes going down its back, sort of behind its eyes. Y'all see that? Wonderful. All right. Um, over here, um, this frog over here is a wood frog. And wood frogs do get to be a little bit bigger than this. This is pretty much a small wood frog, but you can tell it's a wood frog um, because it has this big old black patch um, right on its eye. I'm just trying to move it up so you can see it a little bit better. Is, there, is the lighting decent on this at all? It's just dark. It's just dark? Do you think? Oh, there we go. Oh, do you think you, we could get a light in there? I'm showing. All right, Clarence, yeah, does your phone have like light? Can you get your phone so we could shine a light on this? I mean, if you guys aren't huddling, that's usually pretty good. What? If you guys aren't huddling, yeah. light from there can do pretty well. Yeah. Shine a light on the wood frog so you can better see its distinctive markings. Do you see it better now? You see that black patch on its eye? That's how you know it's a wood frog. Also really common here. All right. Um, a couple of the other frog types that we don't have in here right now, but we can get, are the, um, I think it's called, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a common gray tree frog, which can grow up to about two inches long and can climb up walls, so you have to be a little bit careful about that. That's very uncommon. Um, we could also get the, uh, the pickerel frog. Am I remembering correctly? A pickerel yeah, frog? Pickerel. Which, which looks similar to a leopard frog it, it, uh, in the sense that it has those um, big old black spot sounds back. However, it does not have the same bright low stripes that the leopard frog has. All right. One this thing over, is, right. Yeah, this over here, uh, climbing up the tank right now, is an, is a garter snake, all right, of the uh, eastern variety, all right, because different garter snakes from different regions have slightly different colorations, all right? As you uh, can see, it's fully capable of climbing out, and that's how it got here in the first place. Yes. Uh, especially for the snake tanks, you're going to want to make sure that it's closed completely so that they do not have a chance to escape, all right? So, uh, garter snakes are interesting because they're pretty easy to feed. Um, if you put a small frog in there, they're likely to eat them, especially when you first get them because that's when they're hungriest, all right? Uh, they also um, can grow fairly large up to around this length. This is about as long as we get in here. Can you let make it grow up to about this thick? Um, if you get a large garter snake, um, around week four or five, there is a chance that it can give birth. And by birth, I actually do mean birth. Garter snakes are unusual among snakes because they do give live birth. Uh, last year, we had a mother garter snake that gave birth to seven babies uh, inside one of our tanks. So that's something that you should look out for. All right. Um, over here. Oh, sorry. The design philosophy behind this tank. Quickly. The white as well? Oh. Design philosophy. So over here. And stuff, all, all the stuff that you see over here is sand that we got from the waterfront. Um, you have to wheelbarrow it over there. It's a very long uh, journey, as Andrew can attest to. <laughs> all right. And we pretty much create a slope over here, and this is all water. Uh, frogs like water. They live in it, so make sure they have a lot of water available. Um, we also put a log over here so it looks more natural. Oh, sorry, a piece of bark over here so it looks more natural, and that they have another place to sort of sit and hide if they so choose. All right. Um, the water will appear brown. It will look brown pretty quickly. Um, that's not because it's dirty per se or full of urine, but because like the leaves and stuff in the water do create a sort of tea out of it, which gives it that appearance. So even if you recently changed the water, it's going to appear brownish quickly. It's not because it's actually unclean, but because of the water, uh, of leaf particulates in the water. Same deal with this tank over here, which is our salamander tank. We keep salamanders in here. Um, the types that we get over here are uh, red-backed and spotted for the most part with the occasional hellbender, I believe. Um, you should make sure when you have salamanders uh, that you release them uh, every week because we do not have the means of feeding them here. Um, and they also like to live near water, so we make sure they have some water and some land, uh, which is also sand, that you can uh, rest on. Um, salamanders do have the ability to climb up walls, so make sure that they don't check up on them periodically. They don't move very fast, but they move, and they move up walls. 
So check that out. All right. Uh, there is another type of salamander that's very common here called the red eft. It's bright red. You don't accept that for the critter hunt. All right. People bring in so many of them after a uh, after a heavy rain that. It, it pretty much gets outrageous. People bring an entire fire, fire buckets full of them, and it's also quite bad for the salamanders as they don't really appreciate being heavily handled. So just a few, uh, so red-backed, uh, spotted, red-spotted salamanders and um, spotted salamanders are like the types that we will be accepting for the equipment that should be found in the reptile and amphibian identification book. All right. Anyway, uh, over here is our snake. Bag. Uh, our snake has currently escaped to over there because we did not properly uh, cover this, all right? However, uh, this tank was the place where we kept our snakes for quite a long time and quite successfully, all right? Um, we have a heating rock over here. Um, it's warm. It provide, it, you power it up using the outlet over here. It's why this tank is great where it is over here. Um, Snakes love hanging around it, so put it in a nice open place so that the uh, children can see the snakes better, right? We also provide pieces of bark in here because it provides for a nice place for um, the snakes to hide, especially the smaller snakes like, um, uh, what are this called? Uh, ring snakes, as well as the more uncommon red-bellied snake, which we also do get here. You'll see some frogs and toads occasionally in here in this video. Um, that's because that's what they eat. You, know, you can feed your snakes small frogs and toads, and if they're hungry, they'll eat them. If they're not hungry, then the frogs and toads will just chill out here. The frogs and toads do fine here, even though it's pretty dry. Um, they're just constantly scared hiding. And you'll see a whole bunch of toads um, burrowing into this uh, dirt over here because Snakes do well in dirt. It keeps their scales uh, dry. Um, they enjoy this type of enclosure. If you do have a lot of snakes here, especially if you're feeding them, you're going to want to clean out this uh, dirt every week or two. And underneath all the dirt is going to be a layer of gravel to prevent the snakes from being able uh, to burrow super deep and also make sure that the snakes sort of appear above a visible level. All right. Um, so as for, uh, let's see changing out frogs, right? So large frogs like these, um, these two over here, can eat smaller frogs, so you could keep them for weeks on end. Uh, these smaller frogs um, you should be releasing every week because people bring in so many of them anyway, and also because we don't want them to start death on property. That would not be a good look. Um, it's important that we try to keep a lot of our uh, cold-blooded animals down here uh, where it is colder. The basement is just uh, regularly cold. Um, because uh, the cold air slows down their metabolism, makes sure that they uh, don't starve to death as quickly as they would in a warmer temperature where their metabolism would be higher. Now, is there anything else, parents, that you'd like to add about um, the tanks or the snakes or... Oh, we forgot to talk about what other snakes that we could find here. We did. You said the ringnecks and the red-bellied. Red-bellied. Um, we also get uh, milk snakes. Right. Milk snakes and uh, and eastern hognoses occasionally. Those are the varieties that we get here, and all those should be found in your Audubon book. Um, yeah, as you can see, the snake isn't very hungry right now. Um, all right. It's, uh, oh yeah. By the way, if you do have a larger snake in here, make sure that all oh. these have weights. Water snakes. On them. Water snakes. We also have black water snakes. They look like water moccasins, but they're not because they're not that this up far up north. All right. Woo. So their bites are uh, are uh, anticoagulants, meaning that if you if they bite you, you'll bleed a lot, but you'll die. A lot. Probably. Like a lot of blood. Like it'll be it'll be gross. Yeah. Um, we also do occasion. There are venomous snakes that live in this territory, uh, namely the, uh, what was it, timber the rattlesnake. timber rattlesnake, uh, copper, and copperhead, timber rattlesnake, copperhead, and the coral snake are all found in this region. However, uh, it's been years since we've seen any of those, although the timber rattlesnake was found here within around five years back, like 2015 or 2014. Don't accept them for the critter hunt. Also, if the kids ask, tell them there's no points involved for venomous snakes. You, you instantly lose you if you bring in venomous snakes. 
All right, because you're endangering everybody else. Okay. Uh, telescope. This is not the telescope you'll be using. This is just the one that we can use for demonstrations because, hey, it looks like a telescope, and then you could let the kids touch it because it's not useful anyway. All right, and it's also a pretty simple telescope, um, so you can show different parts of the telescope for astronomy with this. So that's neat. Hmm. All right, uh, what's this thing over here? Let's to the side. Right. Oh, this is telescope stuff. A lot of stuff to clean up. Sorry. All right, so this is our tank setup. All right, this is really important that you pay attention to. All right, so uh, as you can see, we have some oxygenators here. A lot of them are really old. Some are from the 70s, some of them are new. Some of them are from the 80s, all right? Um, anyway, uh, it's really important that you put oxygenators in your tanks, because if you don't, then your tank's gonna run out of oxygen, and fish need oxygen to breathe, all right? So, um, over here, you can see what we kind of do. We like to put gravel on the bottom of the tank. So we talked about gravel before, how you get in there. Um, but the reason why we put gravel at the bottom of the tanks is one, for aesthetics, because it looks cool. It and B, because um, all the little gross bits from maybe like animals being fed in there, falling to the ground, or fish food that settles to the ground, it pretty much settles in there so it doesn't look as visible. It prevents gross stuff it, pre it prevents gross stuff from floating around the tank and also gives um, fish some place to sort of look for food after they've already finished up what they've eaten. All right, so make sure you get some, a layer of gravel at the bottom of your tank. All right. As you can see in here, the oxygenators are uh, they're bubbling. Make sure you get this little round end, at the, the blue bit at the end of your bubbler if you can because it produces more bubbles. Make sure the oxygen it gets dissolved into the water better. Uh, these these uh these hoses are gonna float up if you don't uh, if you don't tie them down to a rock like we did so over here. Um, you could also put crayfish in these tanks. They like to hide out underneath the rocks. Um, if you put in a couple of crayfish in one tank, they'll eat each other. So that's a problem that takes care of itself. Um, there's a crayfish in here right now. Right now it's hiding underneath the big rock. Um, kids rarely bring crayfish though, so it's not something you should really worry about. This over here is our oxygenator setup, all right? So as you can see, Alan's plugged in over here. Uh, and, oh, these, that's what happened to our closet planks. Yeah. Uh, we've used them to support um, the oxygenators, all right? As you can see over here, we've used books as weights to keep these planks um, aloft. However, um, that's not a requirement. If you have any large rock or bricks or cinder blocks or anything like that, you could place here. That would probably be preferable because right now we're using really old copies of National Geographic. All right. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a couple of oxygeners in here. So I put them into a power strip. Uh, a couple of oxygeners in here, tied down the same way. And we have fish in here. Say hi to this fish. Cool. That fish is in the process of pooping. We should probably leave it alone. Okay. Now, this is a um, largemouth bass fry. All right. Largemouth bass is like the biggest fish that we have in Kiwis Lake. Grows to about three feet two inches long. Uh, this one in particular is quite small because it's a fry. It's a baby. Look <laughs> at it its mouth. Yeah, um, incredible. You can tell it's a largemouth bass by uh, you can look at look at it laterally. All right, you can see that it has a black stripe that goes from uh, in front of its face through its eye all the way down its tail. All right. So this is a largemouth bass, and um, for small fish like this, it's entirely possible for you to feed them. In this case, I like to feed it a uh, little shrimp bits. And it eats them. Yeah, we've managed to keep this fish for three weeks. However, if you're not able, this is actually for four weeks at this point, uh, if you're not able to actively like feed one of your fish, then you should release it within a week. Um, it's an, If you can feed a fish, Try to keep it for as long as you can because you never know when kids are going to stop bringing in fish for their critter hunt and need to do a fish dissection for fish and wildlife. That's just a bad spot to be in, all right? You want to avoid that situation if possible. All right, this is not actual fish food. This is turtle food um, that's it's, it's shrimp. And right now, I'm, because this is a small fish, I'm trying to just grind the shrimp up in my fingers so that it's in small enough pieces for the fish to eat. 
I'm gonna use colorful gravel for this one, but obviously we don't have enough colorful gravel for all of the tanks, so we only use it for this one. We also put a whole bunch of decorations in here because this is our bougie tank. Ooh. Um, yeah. Incredible. All right, so I'm just gonna drop the rest of the shrimp in there. This is gonna have a field day. Over here this is our biggest tank. Over here, right? This is where we keep our pumpkin seed. There was two, but now there's one. All right. Oh, I know what happened to the other pumpkin seed. Watch our other videos. Yes, the fish dissection one in particular. Oops, spoiler alert. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, the oxygenator for this one is plugged in through the back. This oxygenator is really good and can pretty much handle an entire tank by itself. Um, yeah, this is a really big one. It's good for up to like 40 or 60 gallons um, of water. So it works. All right. Anyway, uh, this is a pumpkin seed over here. Uh, you can tell it's pumpkin seed by its red and black marking on its uh, gill. So that's neat. It's one of the most common types of fish that we have here, and it can be quite aggressive. We've had pumpkin seeds that have managed to eat frogs, although this one that doesn't really seem to be that interested in food. Um, again, if you can't feed it, make sure you change its water weekly, and that, um, yeah, make sure you change its water weekly, and that it continuously gets fed, right? Anyway, over oh, here, these are glass tanks that we just haven't used. If you want to store insects or other critters or doodads in there, you can. All right. This over here is a tank that we decided to put a fishing spider in. All right. You can tell it's a fishing spider because uh, it's massive and it was found on the water. Right now it has an egg sac that's appearing underneath its body. It's that big old white thing. Uh, we're very lucky that it has not hatched yet. Yeah. You actually can feed fishing spiders that eat things like crickets stuff like that um yeah and you'll just find their exoskeletons shriveled up on so well, well look sorry can we film the uh fish tank seems like this fish is sort of interested in this toad that we put in the water gave it a glance thinking about it it is thinking about it i think we scared him it's possible mm. oh, yeah be hungry you killed him sam oh oopsies We'll come back to him later. All right. This is our toad tank. We get one type of toad, the American toad. Um, kids, well, the toads are like the most commonly brought in thing for a credit hunt. So we like to keep all of our toads nice and visible and easy for kids to place their toads in. Um, it's, that's why we keep it so low. However, you are gonna wanna put up a sign that says do not touch on it because uh, kids will touch the toads because they're not slimy and they're big and they're friendly, all right? You'll have a whole bunch of like small toads, like these, and you'll have a whole bunch of uh, large toads, like these, all right? They like to burrow underneath, underneath the soil and uh, they don't require that much water. They like living on dry land, so you give them dry land to live on, all right? You can tell they're toads because, you know, they're dry um, and they often have warts on their backs, even when they are uh, just babies. All right, extremely common. Um, yeah, uh, when they swallow food, which you can find over by the front of ecology, like insects, um, they use their eyes to push their food into their stomachs. So that's always a fun demonstration for the scouts. Um, for the larger toads, if you want to keep them, I would recommend feeding them at least once a week. They have pretty slow metabolisms, but even so, you want to make sure that they're fed. Um, however, when feeding them, you're going to want to make sure that you put the food uh, directly in front of them because they are incredibly stupid. And, um, <laughs> they really yeah, are. you can feed them daddy long legs, crickets, grasshoppers, ketidids, uh, pretty much any insect that's smaller than them will do. Uh, I've not really known them to eat other frogs, though. They're a bit too fast for their liking. So, uh, yeah, feed toes insects. You should be good. This here is a snog. I use this specifically for reptile and amphibian study, and that's because it's a really poorly made hand puppet, and it looks like both a snake and a frog. So at the end of teaching them the difference between like uh, snakes, frogs, reptiles, amphibians, alligators, crocodiles, whatever, I'm just like, hey, what is this? And then I let them argue with each other. I mean, there's no right answer. It has scales. It does have scales. And frogs don't have scales. However, it has no fangs. Could just be a fangless 
Smack. <laughs> we just shared a moment together. Okay, <laughs> anyway, uh, this over here is our air conditioner. Um, it conditions air quite well, actually. Um, you want to make sure that ecology is kept cool, so leave the door over there closed whenever possible. However, if scouts decide to be degenerates and leave the door open for extended periods of time, you can use the air conditioner to bring the temperature uh, here nice and down. One more thing that I want to mention about the tanks that I forgot to before. If by any chance there's a schmutz that floats to the top of the tank, you can use a net and stuff like that to remove it. Or, uh, what you can do, let's say if, uh, let's try to remove some of this uh, schmutz over here, like this little piece of grass that's floating at the top, right? You could just put your pitcher or bucket of water in there and let water suction pretty much take all the schmutz from the top. Like so. Mm, There's a piece yeah. of grass floating in there now. Going back in, but. Eat that <laughs> grass. Eat your vegetables, pumpkin seed. Yeah. Anyway, that works. So we do it. Oh, this is an example of snakes climbing. The snake is attempting to climb out right now. It, ha it has had its fill um, of this tank and it's trying to move out. They will attempt to use the uh, ledges of the fish tanks as holds from the climb on. Oh, he's gonna get out. He is going to get out. This one is a climber. That's how he got in here in the first place. It really just goes where it wants to. Um, but it's had the courtesy of staying within our tanks. Again, in the future, you're going to want to make your own lids out of cardboard. Because this is really not ideal. He'll come out when he comes out. He does. He will. Uh, we'll just keep an eye on him. Uh, sorry. Okay, so over here, we have our dehumidifier. Doesn't really work. I mean, we have it. The water oh. comes out, it's just still humid in here. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it is infinitely humid down here. Like when you come down here for the first time, I guarantee you everything will be wet. Like yeah. so wet that you're gonna be like, who poured water on all these tables and chairs? Yep, because it's cool in here and water condenses. It's a problem. Yep. All right. So uh, let's see what else. Oh yeah, Clarence, would you like to demonstrate how to siphon water and what you can use it for? I need a bucket though. So I can give you a bucket. Let's say. You need to empty out a tank, right? But you're busy. Because you know we're all busy, hardworking Americans out here. Uh, what I do is just a little siphoning setup. And it allows you to uh, empty a bucket slower than if you use the jug, but without your own work needing to be. So I'll siphon this one, because actually this one has no fish in it. Yeah. Better. Show us what that mouth do. So you're gonna take the duct tape that you have, of course. Just duct tape it like this so that it aims towards the bucket. Put the other half in here. The way that it works is uh, if you use suction to bring the water in the tube below the water level, then gravity will do the rest. So if I'm up here and I like suck, it just goes back down. It goes up, it goes back down. <laughs> That's a risk that you take when you siphon. Fish water. You just clear it out by blowing bubbles back in. Can you put them there? And then you just restart. So now I'm going to do it properly. That's why you don't siphon out gasoline. There you go. And you can just leave it like this. Like, I'd tape it because if you just leave it, it'll dangle around spilling water everywhere. Right. Uh, for, for a large tank, this will take several hours, even if you use multiple um, tubes. So I would still highly, highly, highly recommend using um, the jug method if um, time is not uh, unlimited. However, sorry, if you, if, you have, if you have some time, try to use um, jugs because it's a lot faster. However, if you really press your time or you only need to move, move a little bit of water, such as like trying to move the water from some of the uh, uh, frog or salamander tanks, then this method is, is definitely viable.
right? So, are, are we going to keep sucking at this right now? I'll just let it go until you turn away. Yeah, I think we get to just... That's, that's a noise. It is a noise. Uh, Alright, honestly. Okay. Oh gosh, I tried to stop it. It's actually more powerful than I thought it was. Wow. Alright, well Clarence is dealing with the monster that he created. Um, this is our fish tank. We can keep all of our fish up here. Um, a lot of the stuff is going to be gone by the time that you're here, but, uh, oh. Alright, anyway, uh, don't pay attention to that. Um, yeah, there is uh, <laughs> a whole bunch of uh, mesh nets in here, air pumps, that's where we keep them. Uh, tubing, so if you need more tubing for whatever. Great, you have it. Right for cleaning up tanks in the beginning of the summer. Make sure you sponge them all down. Do not use soap because that could potentially poison the fish. Just rinse all the grime out after, before, and after every summer. All right, this is hot sauce. Um, this is not mandatory, obviously. However, I like to drink hot sauce um, as an incentive for scouts to do work. So, for example, if they identify X number of trees in one session, then I'm going to pour hot sauce into a cup for X number of seconds and then I'll chug that. Pour one out for the boys. Yep. It's hot enough that you can make an expression on your face that shows pain genuinely, but it's also not hot enough that you'll actually want to hurt yourself. All right, so <laughs> over here, this is my gall cup. All right, these are oak galls. And what a gall is, is pretty much a place where a wasp decided, hey, I'm going to insert my babies into here. Uh, so what they do is they pretty much sting an acorn and they insert their larva, sorry, the, the eggs of the wasp eggs, as well as a special type of acid that changes the genetic material of the acorn. Because as you can probably tell, this does not look very much like an acorn. All right. And it pretty much creates this hollow little shell, which has a small ball suspended in it. All right. Kind of like an egg drop science fair project. And inside of that small hard shell at the center, of this gall is going to be uh, your wasp larva. They taste kind of bitter, so I wouldn't recommend eating them. <laughs> um, gloves we keep over here. They're really important for fish dissections. Keep them on hand. Um, this is our broken down telescope, uh, old and ugly. We like to keep them underneath the gazebo um, for demonstrations as to how you should not take care of your telescope. That's just up to you, though. That's a personal teaching strategy that I enjoy. Um, some fire buckets, dish soap over here, keep it available for after fish dissections and whatnot. Um, fire extinguisher, make sure you have one of those. Garbage cans, make sure you have one of those down there, at least one. Um, all right, this is our door. Um, we're leaving it open right now. You should make sure that it's closed. Because you have to leave it open. All right. Um, this spot over here is a place where animals can get in occasionally, so watch out for that. Maybe put something in front of it when you close this place down. All right, over here is where we keep our tools. We have shovels, more shovels, broken shovels, um, a root buster, and a garden shears. We use this stuff to remove the barberry that we showed you um, was living out back in our outside video. All right. Uh, root Buster is really good for removing the roots, which is pretty much where the heart of the barberry is. The shovels are generally all around useful, and the garden shears are great for removing the barberry twigs that are going to get in your face when you're trying to remove the barberry. We keep our gloves over here. Work gloves get really heavily used over the summer, so make sure um, that you check to make sure that the quality sometimes it's nice like the EM2. You're going to have to replace these, a few of these every year. Um, would Clarence like to explain uh, what the uh, hoe on a string is? Ah, the, the hoe and a rope. Hoe and rope. So this is a useful tool for, um, I use it to demonstrate uh, gravity for space exploration uh, with orbit, like I'll rotate it like this. Um, and basically use centripetal force in the place of gravity because it's something that they're already familiar with. You might be thinking, hey, is that hoe gonna fall off that string? No, it's not. And that's because it's not. I, I tied, it's just a simple overhand knot, but it's like the string is wedged up in here. So 
chances are it's not going to fall off. I like to like retie it every once in a while, but I've never even had it come close to slipping off. If it does, um, you'll, sh you'll, you'll know where the first aid kit is in our upstairs video. <laughs> Alright? Um, anything else we need to go over here? Um, Lights, also, they don't really work. You have to flip switches and see which one actually functions. Yeah. Um, that uh, fire alarm there, I'm not sure if that works. Oh, it has. Be hefty if it did. Um, there's no indication that it does. Uh, anything that we missed? Well, no, I think that's it. All right, so I think that's uh, it for today. Thank you for joining us in the basement.